Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, I know the people who are joining us from other parts uh, of the world. Ham Jambo. Uh, it's great to be uh, host this to be hosting this webinar uh, on climate change reporting. Uh, hot in the hills of the Africa Climate Summit uh, that was held last week here in Nairobi. Uh, it was great seeing uh, some of you uh, there. Uh, I've seen uh, the people who've registered. Uh, so definitely we were together uh, last week and we really would have wanted to launch this um, report at, at, at the summit, uh, but due to unavoidable circumstances, we are not able to. Uh, so my name is Kyondo Wawero. Uh, the project manager for the Internews and the Journalism Network, uh, East Africa 111 Cost of Vision Journalism Project. And I am delighted uh, to host you today uh, as we launch our climate misinformation study. It has been two months uh, since most of you joined us in our focus group webinar uh, when we launched this study in July. Uh, we later sent you a survey to help in collecting data uh, for the study, and most of you from Kenya. Uganda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia gracefully uh, took your time to share your thoughts. Uh, to, we, to all of you, we say thank you so much, Asante Sana Murakozi. Our EJN colleagues and consultants have worked tirelessly a day in, night out to make sure we met the tight deadline that we had. We have cleaned, analyzed the data, and wrote the report, and we are super happy that today we are going to present the findings and the recommendations. But please note that we will send you the report, which is currently being designed in a day or two. Uh, for the program today, uh, please note that uh, our study lead, uh, Jackie Lidubwe, and our data analyst, George Wamoya, will present the data findings as well as the recommendations uh, immediately after this uh, introduction. We also do have a guest speaker, uh, Mr. Wallace Gishunge, uh, who is the founding director of the Center for Media Literacy in Kenya. I will introduce him uh, fully uh, when his time comes after the recommendations. Uh, Wallace will help us provide a perspective on the findings, as well as broadly speak about climate reporting in East Africa with a look at the just concluded Africa Climate Summit. Before I call uh, our first speaker, uh, please note a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we'll have a QA and a at the end of the webinar. Uh, please, um, uh, you can ask your questions as we move in as all the speakers speak, but please note that uh, you're supposed to, or we request you to use the Q&A feature uh, below the screen. Please do not use the chat uh, feature. You cannot only use the chat to write your name, country, and media house or your place of work. Uh, please note that we'll be recording this webinar to share with our larger networks uh, through EJN's website and YouTube channel. If you are not a member of EJN uh, yet, you can register on the website, which is artjournalism.net. You will start to benefit from our many opportunities uh, like training, uh, getting story grants to be able to go deeper and to travel, uh, share the stories, as well as, you know, uh, enabling you to, 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 to travel to cover fellowships and other conventions uh, on climate uh, and other environmental work. Um, after uh, the webinar, I will be able to upload, uh, to upload the recording again on our website, as well as uh, on the YouTube channel. And uh, we have our colleague, Hannah, who is behind the scenes, uh, she'll be sending you some text messages on the chat. Uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, one of, of these will be a survey uh, that we'll send you at the end uh, to just tell us your thoughts about the webinar today, uh, what we can improve, and uh, your thoughts uh, on the findings. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, allow me to invite my colleague Jackie uh, Lijibwi, who was the lead researcher for this study, uh, to give us a brief introduction into process uh, that went into it. Uh, Jackie uh, will be followed by George, uh, who will look deeply into the findings as well as the recommendations. So as you're listening, I can you jot down uh, your questions on the Q&A and be able to answer them at the tail end of the webinar. Uh, Jackie, I uh, hope you're ready to go. 
just give me a few seconds so that I can be able to to mm -hmm. share the 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 screen. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Kiundu. Good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, from wherever you are joining in from. And thank you for joining us today. As journalists across East Africa, you play an important role in shaping the public opinion and informing communities on critical issues. Today's report on climate misinformation in East Africa in an era of misinformation. Climate journalism in East Africa in an era of misinformation is not only timely, but also critically important for our region and the world at large. So East Africa has witnessed uh, the harsh realities of climate change from prolonged droughts to devastating floods and the consequent uh, impacts on agriculture, water resources, and even human settlements. Given the significance of these challenges, it is important that information is spread to the public in accurate and biased and, and evidence-based. And misleading information, therefore, it's very in, misleading information, therefore, encourages uh, the dependence on fossil fuels and it hinders uh, uh, climate information that erodes uh, trust to in, for scientists and even journalists. Okay. Yeah, and journalists. So misinformation that climate change itself also affects low-income communities further, uh, compound, compounding the social inequality about uh, climate change. So for this uh, study that we are looking at uh, climate uh, journalism in East Africa, and specifically we had the following uh, objectives. The first one was to determine the climate change reporting habits among the journalists in East Africa. The second one was to explore journalists' perceptions and understanding of climate change. The third was to access journalists' perceptions uh, regarding climate misinformation and disinformation and practices that surrounding it. And finally, we want to ascertain the need for training on climate mis and disinformation. For the methodology, we used a mixed uh, method uh, approach whereby we used both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, the quantitative phase, we did the uh, snowballing for the online survey. And then the qualitative phase, we had the uh, purposeful sampling for focus group discussion, FGDs, and we did the uh, key informant interviews. Uh, the responses, we got uh, 468 responses for the online surveys. And we thank you so much. Most of the journalists who participated in the survey, we got uh, very good feedback from you. And during our first webinar, which Kiundu has mentioned in July, we, want, we managed to do eight focus group discussions and we also got great uh, feedback. And also finally, we did uh, key informant interviews with some of you who joined the, the meeting today and we are very grateful. We did uh, four interviews in Ethiopia, four interviews in Uganda, uh, three interviews in Kenya and three interviews. Uh, so to take us through the findings, I'll invite uh, our data analyst, George, to take us through this session. Thank you and hello everyone. Uh, I know we are all eager to get to hear exactly what the findings were. Indeed, it was uh, an interesting moment uh, interrogating this data and uh, really coming up with, uh, with uh, concrete findings, conclusions, and uh, really some way forward, some recommendations and way forward uh, in this very interesting debate. So as uh, Jackie had said, one of our objectives, the first objective actually, was to determine the habits. And we found very interesting results. Uh, the first one is that a substantial se segment of the journalists, two thirds of the journalists, were having a story or a feature on climate at least once a month. That was quite interesting. And it suggests that uh, climate reporting has picked up and one of the issues that uh, actually is in our media houses. This information, when we traced it, was actually being driven by governments, 
and subject area experts. Those were the key sources because uh, usually when governments uh, give uh, directives, those who are taken verbatim and uh, disseminated. Uh, and again, once in a while, subject area experts came in handy to substantiate issues here and there. Again, we also found out that journalists in the region, and, and for information, these habits are homogeneous. They are the same, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia. You expect similar habit. So journalists are also relying on uh, other sources uh, like the international media houses, Reuters, CNN, uh, BBC, etc. Uh, particularly so to try and localize that information and applying it into the local context. Sometimes it fits in, other times it fails to sit in. We also found out the social media and internet played a great role in the sourcing and in the dissemination of climate information. Now, an interesting one was when journalists uh, go out uh, there to get this climate information, there was some sort of a balance they were playing between the proponents and the skeptics of the fact that climate change is happening and is being caused by humans. So for this one, journalists tend to take uh, like a middle ground, uh, probably because of some reasons, uh, some findings uh, hereafter will show. Again, governments come in authoritatively and journalists are passionate and they want their respective governments to take action on people who are destroying the environment or people who are engaged in activities that are likely to uh, destroy uh, our climate. We also found out that there's a segment of the journalists who want to represent climate change as a fake concept. So those are the findings uh, about the reporting habits. Then we also went further and tried to understand what are the perceptions of the journalists regarding climate change? What are their perceptions? And we found some very interesting results here. The passion behind uh, journalists and engagement in this uh, particular area is that they want to sensitize their communities regarding the harm caused by the climate change. They want uh, to put across information regarding the solutions and regarding mitigation, particularly so to strengthen the resilience uh, of the communities. However, in terms of the understanding, there were very major disparities in the opinions among the journalists. There was not an agreement. Everyone had uh, like their own uh, description or perception of what uh, this uh, climate change thing is. And so there are major gaps in the mastery of the climate knowledge among the journalists. In fact, I want to quote uh, one of the, the respondents uh, who had this to say. Climate change is very complex. Climate terminologies such as carbon emissions, carbon credits, carbon footprint, climate crisis, climate disinformation, climate vulnerability are intimidating. Contextualizing scientific information for lay audiences can be quite a challenge. It requires a process to unpack the scientific material. That journalist kind of summarized the kind of varied opinions that exist among the journalists. So that being the case, there is a lack, much as there's a boldness to pass across information about climate change, there's a lack of confidence on the subject matter among the journalists. And this puts us at a risk of practicing involuntary misinformation, especially so if the source of that information is uh, not uh, credible. So the other thing is this, 
in absence of this gap, what is the way forward? When we asked journalists about training, would they be interested? About 98%, nearly everyone, said they were interested in training on how to identify and report on climate myths and disinformation and on how to improve reporting on climate change in general. Now, this is a highly summarized uh, uh, level, high level summary of the findings and we would encourage uh, our audience to get into the detailed report. There is an explanation. There are other detailed explanations unto each and every finding, and we encourage you to go into it. But these key highlights lead us to a point where we need to pause and ask ourselves, if that is the case, this is where our journalists are. This is a climate information and a climate change subject. What is the way forward? What conclusions came about after analyzing the entire study? What recommendations would we make for the journalists? Would we make for the media houses? Would we make for, 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 for uh, the practitioners and even uh, financiers? Because it calls for some action. And to take us through to that uh, section of conclusion and the recommendations, I want to hand over back to Jackie so that she can summarize and we see the way forward. Thank you, members. Thank you so much, George. That was precise and, and concise. I thank you for that uh, report. So in conclusion, and these are just some of the conclusions, more conclusions are in the final report that you'll be able to get and read through it. So we concluded that climate reporting in East Africa is still in the early stages of development. That was one of the conclusions. And there also there is exist an active pool of young, well-educated and experienced journalists. That was a positive because if we have this, then we are on the right track. And many journalists lack knowledge on climate change, which is essential for journalists aiming to effectively cover this complex and critical issue. Another conclusion was few journalists specifically focus on climate change, which can result in lack of comprehensive coverage when they don't look at it in totality. Many aspects of the issue remain unexplored and are reported, leaving the audience with an incomplete understanding. So, um, more on conclusions, we also saw that accessing credible climate experts and researchers is a challenge. That one came out really well. Most across the countries, uh, there was a challenge whereby journalists cannot be able to uh, get in touch with the experts. And so in a conclusion, there was lack of access. And then climate uh, current climate reporting largely adopts global perspective perspective focusing on overarching trends and international agreements. Also in this category, it falls uh, when we are talking about climate change, we are only talking about like climate summit, like the one that happened in Nairobi last week. We are talking about COPs and other international, international conventions and conferences on climate change. So we lack a local perspective. And then climate programs are slow in attracting commercial sponsors. So that's why most media houses don't have like climate desk and they don't have uh, resources allocated to issues on climate change. And also another conclusion was funding for climate change reporting is low and inadequate. The few funds that are there cannot be able to cover many journalists so that they can be trained. To our recommendations, we had several recommendations for journalists, for media houses, for fund organization, and even for journalist networks. For the journalist, uh, the first recommendation we, we came up with that uh, journalists should enhance their capacity to report on climate change and to detect and analyze information about climate change through study and training, which is lacking. Uh, additional training, uh, specifically on climate mis disinformation on countering its effects would also be helpful. So apart from training on climate change, we also need another training on climate mis and this. 
And then another recommendation for journalists, there is a huge scope for more enterprise reporting on climate change. Whether we are looking at the impacts of climate change, looking at the solution on climate change, investigating the drivers of greenhouse gases and emissions. There are several angles that we can look at when we are talking about climate change and we don't just need to look at maybe the impacts of climate change alone. And then another finding for the journalist was uh, journalists need to collaborate with one another to integrate climate change into broader stories. We not only need to have uh, stories on climate change alone, but we can integrate climate change in politics, in health, because there's a different intersection between uh, climate change and various uh, disciplines. Uh, recommendation for journalist network. The first recommendation was that journalist networks need to establish relationship with climate experts and research institution, and ultimately creating a reliable network for journalists to access accurate information. And even by doing this, they can come out with uh, even um, a list of experts, whereby when someone wants to talk to an expert, you just know you can get those uh, a list of all experts and you can be able to access to them. And also journalist networks need to organize climate related conferences, workshops and events to connect with experts and establish relationship over time because that now becomes easy for journalists when they want to do reports on climate change. And then the Another uh, recommendation for the journalist networks was uh, journalist networks can seek assistance from climate organization or non-government organization that have capacity in climate journalism so that they can be able to get some funding and uh, have uh, this workshop for their networks. For media houses, we recommended that uh, media houses need to organize training for their journalists, or at least allow their journalists to participate in such trainings wherever they are available. And also media houses need to enhance the capacity of their editorial teams to integrate climate reporting into their day-to-day -day, uh, reporting on, the, on other content. So it doesn't just need to be exclusive climate change, but we can integrate climate change in other reporting, like business reporting, like health reporting, like political reporting, because climate change affects all these disciplines. And then we need also to create dedicated climate sections, allowing specialized journalists to cover the issue more intensively. So apart from integrating it, we can also have a climate desk. We have gender desk, we have sport desk, we have political desk. We need also to have climate desk with climate editor and climate journalists in our media houses. And then media houses need to collaborate uh, between media, uh, there need to be a collaboration between media outlets, experts and government organization and government bodies to ensure a well-rounded and comprehensive coverage of climate change issues. So these were part of the recommendations and, uh, and conclusions. And we have many of these uh, and more information in our report. And we hope that you can be able to look at it, integrate, uh, critique it, and see how it can help us uh, in this climate misinformation. Thank you so much, Asante Nisanapakutuskiliza. Over to you, Kiyundu. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Jackie, as well as uh, George, uh, for that brief and concise uh, presentation of uh, the findings from our report. Uh, which are very interesting and all encompassing. Um, I won't go uh, into analyzing that uh, because we, you know, have our experts. Uh, but I like one point where you say that climate change encompasses almost all aspects of life, and that should be reflected uh, in the kind of work we do. We tell politics of climate change. We tell um, how. Uh, biodiversity and climate change, uh, health and climate change, and that way we are able to localize the stories that we've seen from the report are uh, mostly uh, full of uh, the global narrative. Uh, I see over 20 people have joined us since I did the intro introduction, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, but I need you to know that we are requesting you to ask your questions as we move on. And, and if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will still have a Q and A uh, icon as well as a chat icon. Please uh, send your questions uh, through the Q and A. Uh, so far, I see one question. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to 
uh, find as many as the people we are. Uh, we are about 80 uh, participants. That's a good number. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, there is a chat icon as well. Uh, use the chat uh, to tell us who you are, where you're joining us from, and your organization. Uh, I see apart from the media, we have a lot of colleagues uh, from uh, from the climate change or the environment sector, uh, if you like. Uh, now, I uh, will take this opportunity uh, to invite uh, our guest uh, speaker uh, for today. I had mentioned him, uh, Mr. Wallis Agishunge, uh, who is the founding uh, director of the Nairobi-based Center uh, for Media and Information Literacy. Uh, he's a media communications practitioner uh, with over 15 years experience in private and public institutions. Mr. Gishunga has taught journalism, mass communication, and public relations in our local university here in Kenya. He's an external resource person on media and information literacy for UNESCO, GW Academy, and African Union Commission, as well as DCN Global, among others. Mr. Gishunga's interests are in media and in information literacy, and its implications on climate information and awareness, a civic engagement, governance, and a democracy. Uh, it's so good uh, to have you, uh, Mr. Gishunge. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's a good choice. Uh, we're we having you today, uh, seeing you been into education and interested in climate change. Uh, it's very important on what we are talking today because we've seen one of the major uh, recommendations uh, uh, is for more trainings uh, on climate change. Uh, so I let you take the floor and then we'll have a brief discussion before we open the floor to answering the questions. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kildo. Thank you, Jackie and George. Thank you, participants and the EGN for this opportunity. Uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, uh, we are speaking to a very special uh, group of uh, respondents for that research, the journalists, and uh, the findings do not really resonate uh, because uh, journalists are said uh, are other, uh, they can be people up there, they are the opinion leaders in terms of uh, dissemination of information. So if they plead not to know, uh, then uh, there is something wrong with uh, the whole situation. But either way, I think my opening remarks would have been that uh, uh, the subject of climate change is actually for everybody. If it does, uh, uh, where I come from, the next question after you have asked someone how they have been is how the weather is. So that's an aspect of climate. So if someone has been around for 30 years and they have been speaking about how the weather has been, and probably uh, if they took uh, recordings of what they have been saying about their, uh, those weather changes, then they would be having a report about their climate in that particular area. So with this slide, you are seeing that uh, it can be a presidential matter, it can be a village matter, it can also be a scientific matter. So that's where uh, we are saying that every human being, members of the public, the powerful, the, the expert, everybody talks about climate change. But we need journalists to put that discussion into context. That's why we have to combat this issue of uh, misinformation in climate reporting. So uh, um, my colleagues earlier uh, talked about uh, uh, the summit that just ended. I think uh, the, the, the timing of this particular webinar is very, very much uh, in order because everybody in Kenya at the moment is climate change. When you look around the, all the newspapers, when you listen to the radio, when you see the social media, we are still having the uh, overlaps. Rather, the, the, there are more, there's a lot of climate talk in the last uh, three weeks. So this is the correct timing. So, but for me, I think uh, climate uh, change right now has been influenced. The stories have been influenced by what has been happening in the country. Uh, probably we did not have uh, that plethora of so many stories in me within uh, a short period of time. Uh, Mr. Kyodo and uh, EJN probably there's something you can check uh, in terms of uh, the amount of climate stories that are being taken probably within a period of time. But for now, 
we are competing. The climate change is, uh, stories are competing with other stories. In Kenya, uh, for example, we talk about uh, the soft side of things. Uh, people are, you have so many influencers uh, with their own content. Uh, probably people are not getting serious content. And that could be part of what is uh, making climate reporting because people think that it is a very complex scientific and probably something for somebody else. And uh, But after all that reporting, what does the industry say? Because this is a research report about journalists and their perception of climate issues. We have a chance to cover all the experts within one week. And there are so many arrays of information, experts, uh, topics to be covered. But here is one a very uh, experienced editor who said that that particular uh, summit reduced journalists to by its status with jargon and subject complexity. Another thing that he heard was that the role of journalism was to interpret observations and issues into new copy for audiences. Therefore, there is need for journalism, this is a conclusion, for uh, to have a technical grounding for grasp of subject matter, that is the climate change, so that they are going to avoid reporting the form rather than the content. So uh, that climate summit that was uh, at KSEC, probably if you do a content analysis, according to Emeka Gekara, is that you will find much of it was on the form, probably how a uh, was present, what cars they came with, you know, uh, the length of head, the kind of uh, accreditation and all that. But rather the content was lost in the detail because probably the journalists avoided uh, tackling the technical issues regarding climate change. That is take number one. Take number two was from the nation media groups, uh, a public editor, a very experienced uh, journalist, Mr. Aurora. He, he says that uh, he was happy with the coverage because there were about eight pages of climate service in the, the entire week. And actually, if you look at even today's papers, if you look at all the social media that I've said, we are going to see that there are other aspects of climate, uh, the uh, spin-off of uh, those topics being covered. So to him, that was a, a plus because so many aspects of that, uh, of the subject matter climate change have been covered. But again, he has us here, the bill of climate change reporting has been, and it continues to be the complexity of the subject and the effect in breaking down stories so that they are understandable to the people. Now here he is accusing the journalists of not stepping down the jargon so that people can relate to what climate, mean, climate change means to them. And so he says that the journalist, the, the challenge to journalists is to provide the stories that resonate with the people, yeah. his conclusion. I will do take number three from a veteran uh, journalist himself, uh, Alphonse Shudu, who is now a fact checker with Africa Check. And uh, him, he was writing, and they tend to agree with him, uh, respond to Emaka uh, Yakara, the editor, the first take on the people there. Uh, for him, he is not. Uh, blaming the journalist per se. He is actually uh, feeding into what the findings have been shared by George and Jackie previously, that there is need to empower the journalist through capacity building. And here he says, journalists must read widely. So for them to be that, uh, because climate reporting is a specialty. I don't know when you're in the news of whether you are a political reporter or what, but you, you can't be a jack of all trades as a, sometimes being encouraged by media houses as they uh, retrench and uh, decide stuff like that, which is something that we can discuss later on. But there has to be specialty uh, uh, climate reporters so that uh, not everybody covers the sea at the same time is covering the earth, the forest, and also is covering the atmosphere. You need to specialize to a certain level so that you become an authority in that area and you are able to break down uh, this matter to audiences. So uh, again, the conclusion by Arthur Shudo here is that journalists need to relate, not just to report. Here, we are not going to do the five Ws and the H. We are going to go beyond that so that uh, audiences know exactly how climate change at, uh, affect them in their own context. 
So uh, what's the role of media in climate reporting? I think this has been circled. Even uh, you are a journalist, you know it, but uh, you just go through some of the points. You act, uh, 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 you act as channels for uh, and sources for, of credible climate information. I'm talking about credible information here because there is that element of misinformation. So uh, journalists are always thought to be, or rather ought to be, the sources of credible information. Hence, uh, journalists should be able to give credible information on climate change and enable the citizens make informed decisions as a result of what they get from climate journalism. Also, uh, that uh, climate reporting would facilitate informed climate debates between diverse social and political actors. Here they're talking about the people in politics, the implementers of policy, policy makers, etc. Uh, then it also provides citizens to contextualize and relatable climate information and help them learn about their immediate climate experience and the world beyond, and also help in mitigating mit uh, climate mitigation, that is build communities resilient adaptation to climate change. These are terms that are used in webinars and uh, uh, seminars and events. But uh, the citizens there who are there in the millions need to know what is this uh, thing called resilience? How can I take part? How can I participate? And it's not just about planting trees, like someone said in another webinar, because we seem uh, to do a lot of planting tree and we say we have fought climate change. There is more than that. And then uh, lastly, build trust and public engagement that can combat climate misinformation and disinformation. Very important. Again, it's tied to the first problem where there is issue of information credibility. So we should be able to build a, a band of uh, uh, credible uh, climate reporters who have uh, the correct information about various aspects of climate change. I think after that, uh, I can add there, and then we get back to uh, discuss the, uh, the findings and yeah, the research. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wallace, uh, for that you know, very incisive uh, presentation as well, and as, as giving us perspective and using the ACS uh, you know that's hot uh, from last week, yeah. And and I interestingly I read uh, I read those articles uh, that we've shared, and I know most of the colleagues uh, who are joined here today also read that because they were shared in some journalistic groups. And it's very interesting to see uh, that most journalists did uh, you know uh, comment on this, and also being at the ACS uh, and going into you know, all those side events, uh, sometimes you leave there with a headache. Actually, one journalist uh, told me that they left uh, with a headache uh, because of the jar the kind of jargons uh, that are used there uh, and the kind, uh, and because we are not exposed to reporting on these, as you have asked me, uh, was I a political writer? I was a science writer. Uh, personally, I was happy to come in as a features writer and I was very, very interested in what we used to call development uh, kind of journalism that is not very popular in our newsrooms. I was interested in telling stories of environment, uh, health, and I think that's why I ended here at Internews, uh, which, as most people know, is a media development organization where we give uh, you know, resources and capacity built uh, for our colleagues there for the state to be able to tell these stories. and. Uh, when I was reporting uh, about 10 years ago, it was very difficult uh, for media houses to give us uh, these kind of opportunities uh, for training. And it's even worse uh, today because we all know what is happening uh, with the loss of you know, revenue, you know, as well as um, uh, which has led to retrenchments. Uh, and the other problem is our colleges, we don't really specialize. Uh, you, you, get trained uh, to be a journalist, but know how to tell science stories. So uh, it's left to uh, individual interest to be able to pass through these kind of courses, uh, looking for people you know, like ourselves uh, who do these kind of trainings. And it's really uh, a difficult uh, journey uh, to be able to tell these stories. And uh, we're grateful that we've been able uh, to do this uh, research that actually is putting uh, scientific data uh, into what uh, most experts like those articles, you know, have shown there. And I've seen, before we go to the questions, I've seen something very uh, interesting, Wallace, uh, Jackie, and George, 
draft from our report uh, where we're saying that uh, uh, one of uh, uh, you know what we came out we, we found out is that two that uh, of the people that we polled for this survey tell climate change stories and uh, and then near 98 percent as George told us would want to be trained on climate change. So to that is about 75%, right? So if 75% of the 500 uh, that participated in, the, in this poll uh, from the four countries, if 75% are telling these stories and 97% of the 75% wants to be trained, what does that mean? Can anyone answer that question? Yeah, I George. think let me go. Uh, yeah, let George. me go because I interacted with the data more. Okay, uh, you find that uh, journalists are very confident uh, when it comes to whatever topic uh, they are handling. So that confidence, uh, for most, gives them the robustness and the confidence to go after climate stories. Some will go to the field tell about maybe a flood that happened, uh, famine some boreholes that are dried, etc., uh, etc. Et some will go into, into, um, uh, into climate experts in the universities. Others are bold enough to even go to the scientific journals. But admittedly, in fact, this even featured in our last webinar, some of that information in the journals is too technical especially so for somebody who never interacted with uh, geography or anything to do with, uh, uh, with weather and climate, for them to decode that information, it, it's an uphill task. And that is why there is this passion, you'll find on one hand is this passion, people want to tell their mothers, their grandfathers, their, uh, their grandmothers about climate change, but on the other hand, there's a limitation because there is only this much uh, I can do with this kind of data. So what is the way forward? If somebody out there knows about climate reporting, I would rather attend that class, see how it is done, see how this data can be processed, decoded, and packaged in a way that uh, the layman can understand. Even uh, the weather forecast, uh, I know in Kenya, people are used to Guata Francis. When Guata Francis is presenting those uh, figures, uh, 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 people want to go out and find out, okay, he says tomorrow there'll be rain. Yes, so if tomorrow he, he doesn't rain, uh, it means he was wrong. But Guata Francis may have mentioned maybe a, a, a small region like say Kajiado, but Kajiado is so wide. But if you are careful enough, somewhere within Kajiado, if he said it will rain, there is a small section within Kajado that we rain. But if my grandmother went out and found there was no rain, he will say these people are liars. So there's some sort of a training that is uh, necessary. And that is what uh, journalists are saying, yes, please train us. What is this climate information? So that now they can be more confident in uh, tackling the issue. Over to you, uh, Kiyundu. Thank you so much, uh, George, for that answer. Uh, I need to bring to your attention, George, as well as Jackie. Uh, thank you so much for answering the questions uh, directly uh, live on the Q&A. Uh, but some of these questions, we really like to hear them voiced. Yeah, uh, because we are recording this and we share with the people that would join. And uh, when we, we upload the recording, we don't have, um, uh, we don't have the Q&A. Uh, so it would have been great to answer the questions. I really wanted to come to uh, Mr. Tim Spence. Uh, there is a question that he had asked, uh, you know, about the breakdown of the media coverage of climate environment issues. In other words, is there more coverage on TV, radio, newspapers, and online? And I wanted to bring that to Mr. Wallace as well because I thought it's very important uh, that most of our respondents are with radio. And, and, and we know uh, that the radio uh, reaches uh, a lot uh, more people uh, due to its affordability and its mobility. You can uh, you know listen to that on phone. And then again, uh, we know climate change, the impacts of climate change are mostly uh, felt uh, by the communities, uh, mostly 
uh, fish or pork, as well as uh, farmers and definitely all people. And we really need to uh, to use this uh, radio. Uh, George, can you follow that up uh, with the language? Uh, what did we find out about the languages? Because it would be uh, very important to be able uh, to localize um, climate change uh, information. Uh, so your answer was uh, uh, radio 55%, website uh, 36% uh, of respondents uh, from radio 55, website 36%, TV 27, newspapers 26%, which is really, uh, you know, very interesting. Uh, because if you scrutinize uh, uh, these results, uh, probably they'll tell you a larger story uh, of the media outlook uh, in Kenya, like uh, the print, which are really been uh, very popular in magazines, are really being overtaken uh, by other uh, platform. But I digress. Uh, Bernard George, can you tell us more about the, the language? You might be on mute. If you're speaking, you're on mute. Still on mute. Oh, sorry, it's because I was sharing a screen uh, at the same time and uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you actually put it that radio was the most impactful. When it comes to the language, we realize, yes, uh, in, uh, allow me to go country by country. Amharic uh, in Ethiopia is, uh, is the most uh, prevalent, but then there are other journalists working in each of the countries. Amharic is a dominant in Ethiopia, uh, English in uh, Uganda, uh, Kiswahili in Tanzania, English and uh, Kiswahili in Kenya, but the bulk of journalists have also ventured into the local languages and they're in plenty. Uh, those of you who will uh, take time to read through the report, uh, we have uh, quite a number of uh, uh, languages that uh, are being broadcasted. And in each of those languages, stories about climate uh, information, climate change are being shared. So don't be surprised that uh, somebody got information from uh, the government or from a subject area expert. They have to translate it into a local language. So uh, you can see the task and uh, the, 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 the weight journalists have to go through uh, those murky waters trying to translate maybe technical information and translate it and unpack it into a language that uh, a lay person in the village can understand. So we cannot really underestimate the power of radio in reaching out to those uh, rural communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone wants to add anything on that? Uh, thank you, Kudo. Can I go? Yes, please. Yes, I uh, agree that uh, in Eastern Africa, radio is key. But it goes, especially in the rural areas, where we are seeing uh, climate affects the people the more. And also, uh, it's an easy way of uh, consuming information as you go about your business. Uh, but uh, questions about, about uh, the level of journalism being practiced on radio. Uh, in terms of uh, professionalism, in terms of ethics, and therefore, in terms of the quality of information. But again, I also agree that uh, since majority of the citizens are in radio, and there are many radios now availing information in local languages, then that's an opportunity for journalists basically to reach out to the critical mass of people who are being affected by climate by packaging information that is useful to those people. But the issue of the language again comes up, especially the local languages. The other day we learned in Kenya, in Kiswahili, I don't know about the Tanzanian colleagues, but in Kiswahili, we learned that uh, climate change is called Tabianichi. And uh, people were making jokes around it because uh, I think it was the first time they were interacting with that uh, uh, word as in reference to climate change. So I would want to imagine uh, how it is in my local language. Uh, I didn't listen to it, so I don't know how they were reporting it, but I would take, I would take uh, an interest. But basically my point is that uh, 
there is a lot of opportunity of reaching the critical mass if we package climate information in local languages. And uh, apart from the English, we can leave uh, the Ivory Tower staff climate change to the English, but then the one that really affects the people, the one that want to package, we can reach them through the medium they like them as artist radio. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. Okay, maybe if I can add on the on the side of maybe radio being key, and uh, the most of the radios that we sampled were the community radio stations, the journalists that responded, and also and also vernacular radio stations. So there was this in literature review we we discovered that the biggest problem with climate change reporting and mis and disinformation it is uh, the scientists are accusing journalists of oversimplifying the matter, of not presenting the matter very well. And the journalist on the other hand, also not uh, saying the scientists use a very complicated jargon to explain even a single matter. So that was a gap that we reviewed in the literature review. And also just to come for, for the conclusion and even the recommendation, that's why there needs to be a collaboration between the experts the journalists and other stakeholders in the climate space so that they can be able to communicate the, uh, the right things. That's why I'm also laughing at uh, Wallace about Tabia Inch. People are saying, is it Tabia Inch or Halia Hell or Halia Anger? So it was a discussion that has been going around for the last, I think, one week and even after the climate summit. Thank you. Uh, talking of Tabianchi as well as uh, Alia Hewa, uh, Mr. Wallace, George, and Jackie, what do you call climate change in your local language? Yeah, that's where the disconnect is. What, what do you call so it, if... Jackie, yeah, in, your, in your local language? <laughs> do we even have it? <laughs> that's a challenge. That's the challenge. Yes, what, what we have, what we discuss is the weather, not the climate. Yeah. <laughs> so probably the best we can do is to explain, uh, you know, like, and that's why we really need to understand what climate change, you know, like, you know, it's, it's change of weather patterns uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, so probably uh, maybe, the best we can do as journalists is to to explain these uh, to our audiences. But uh, we, of course, have to do a lot of reading, as Shundu uh, said, uh, from the you know, fact-checking organization. And I'm looking at these questions, and I see they all similar, and they're looking at uh, what we've already uh, provided. But there is one uh, interesting one that I'm finding, and I don't think we are able to answer this, from Duku uh, Karyuki, who is asking, were our newsrooms ready for the ACS? Was there a need to set up an expert desk, like how they do it during political events? Uh, what do you think about this? And participants uh, on the chat, uh, could you tell us, uh, I think for this one, we'll be allowed to talk about our, our ethnic uh, backgrounds. Can you tell us uh, what is your ethnic background and what you refer to climate change uh, in your local language? Uh, it would be interesting to find that out, and I think I will, I will ask Hannah to save that for us so that we can share with you later uh, when we're sharing the resources and we can see what other communities refer to as climate change, and that can start a very interesting conversation uh, on or if uh, we are able to tell these stories if if we have just you know uh, this one word of climate or how we refer to that. Um, so this question up by Karaoke, do 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 we know? Uh, I know the nation. And even the standard uh, have now here in Kenya, uh, they have climate desks. Uh, I don't know our colleagues who are joining from uh, the New Vision, uh, the Monitor, uh, the Guardian in Tanzania. Can you please tell us uh, if you're having climate desks uh, in your newsrooms, uh, you can put that uh, on the chat. Uh, Wallace or George or Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you do, uh... Yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, I, will, I, I will not purport to answer for any media house, but since I was there, uh, and I have attended a number of uh, climate summits 
I think yeah, for the people in Kenya, for the media houses in Kenya, probably they were overwhelmed. They may not be having enough personnel, but in terms of uh, deploying personnel to cover, yes, they did. Uh, but as we said, uh, that issue about uh, downsizing and uh, probably spreading a journalist too thin uh, to cover everything about climate rather than sections of climate uh, could have been overwhelming. Uh, personally, I think they're trying to even uh, get in touch with some of them to have a uh, session that we had uh, covered. But of course, uh, it, it, it happened during the day of uh, the declaration. So every journalist went there. And so we will just to follow up with the same. But in terms of uh, preparation, they probably they can do better by deploying more personnel and also by having uh, journalists not cover everything climate, but specialize in areas of climate so that they're able uh, to give a, a proper breakdown for the audiences. Thank you. So for what? my take on this, I would uh, say uh, some media houses were very much prepared. I watched extensively the NTV. I was at the climate summit. I saw what they did for NTV. I think they covered the event from around 9 to all the way to 4 p.m. Kenya Broadcasting Corporation was there as early as 6 a.m up to news time, the 9 p.m. news. They did, they had also, they had packaged some stories, features in between to do that. And they did for all the three days they were there, they were there throughout with the environmental stories, climate change stories. And for the two media houses, I would maybe attribute it for having a climate desk or having dedicated reporters and editors on journalists who work on climate issues and environmental issues. I was, able to keenly follow those two at stations, but basically the media center was very busy. It had all media houses and they were transmitting live. Everything was about climate change. So I think they did a good job. Let's give credit where it's due. Yeah. Um, I think the articles Jackie was saying and many other people uh, feel the same. Um, were we just reporting uh, for the sake of reporting? Were we just repeating what the experts uh, were saying? Or were we, you know, uh, giving uh, the audiences uh, the jargon they're also having? Uh, because, of course, uh, there were a lot of live, you know, links where you just, you know, get um, uh, experts, uh, you know, giving the perspective of what was happening. Uh, but were we able, uh, you know, to bring this to, uh, to the common monanchi or to the ordinary citizen, as we like uh, to say, I think that's uh, the biggest question. Yeah, I, I noticed there was uh, all the media houses were really out there, even from the region and internationally, uh, to be able to break these stories. But the last question did we tell these? Uh, it was a busy time. Personally, I was able to uh, watch and read a few newspapers. I liked, uh, I think it's Citizen. Uh, who on the one of the conference had, um, I think the buzzword was carbon credits uh, and how to trade uh, in the carbon market. I mean, what is carbon? What is a carbon market? And they had uh, a panel interview uh, with experts who were really trying to bring it down. And I think the following day, they had an explainer on what you know carbon uh, markets are. Uh, I, I think uh, that's what we are saying, uh, that we need to create uh, uh, this capacity, uh, but if then again, media houses are losing revenue and they are treating people left, right and center, uh, who, you know, uh, who will who will do this? Uh, what can be done? How can we collaborate uh, with uh, organizations like NGOs and uh, CSOs and the government to be able uh, to tell this story that uh, I like to say, and I've heard it, people say that is the story uh, of the uh, century. Uh, I think many questions, including from uh, my good friend here, uh, Willie Chowo. Um, he's asking, um, wouldn't you recommend for the introduction of fact checking in the newsroom to debunk the spread of climate change this information in our society. Um, uh, George, you've answered that. 
uh, if we don't fact check, we will end up with misinformation. We have recommended further study on the expectation of climate experts on climate journalism. Yes, indeed. Uh, kindly note this colleague. Uh, we're calling this a pilot uh, study. Uh, we really had uh, limited funds as well as limited time. We did this in about four months. Uh, and uh, we are recommending that uh, there should be more of you know these trainings uh, looking into what all your good people are asking how can uh, people you know collaborate how can how best can we tell these stories uh, how can we tell these trainings uh, should, should we have uh, these embedded universities and according to your experience uh, Mr. Geshunge uh, you've trained at the University of Nairobi and elsewhere uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, do you find this kind of course is being taught there and for communicators and journalists? And and what do you recommend can be done uh, going forward? Thank you, uh, Kimdo, the panelists, the, the participants. Yes, I think uh, the university will be a very good entry point uh, to skill journalists in climate analysis. Uh, in one of our, our groups where Jackie and I are very active members, uh, people say that uh, Kenya, we are teaching American journalism, that people come to learn Kenyan journalism in the media houses. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, some, some, uh, some SOS, schools of journalism are, are not uh, kind of updated their curriculum to factor in some of these uh, upcoming uh, thematic issues like climate change. Uh, sometimes one of the schools in uh, Nyanza uh, had everything embedded with IT. Probably for marketing purposes, but we saw some of the graduates do marvelous jobs. We need to uh, upscale, not that we have just, uh, in, uh, in the practice of journalism, rather the study of journalism, we need to have uh, like people branch for broadcast the people branch for uh, uh, electronic, uh, people branch for print, we need to have probably climate journalism as one of the options. So that someone may tackle a huge chunk of issues related to climate analysis. Maybe from that year to four year. It's just a, a suggestion, uh, not that it's happening anywhere. But I think also uh, you have said that this is a subject matter that will outlive all of us. I don't think uh, issues of climate, climate change are going. Uh, to end in time soon. It's not like uh, the pandemic, which was lasted only uh, a maximum of uh, a few months. Climate change is here to stay. And uh, probably it is uh, for those who are in the uh, schools of journalism, this is the new entry point. And also for the media houses, I would suggest that uh, uh, survival of the media houses and also sustainability in journalism, you would have to factor in climate journalism into it because. Here in Nairobi, for example, you are talking about what? Uh, funding. We are funding various aspects of climate change. Awareness creation and publicity is part of that. Capacity building is part of that. Media houses need to, uh, and schools of journalism for that matter, and anyone else who is interested in this space, this is the time now to actually skill up and maybe join into the climate action. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Bona Wallis, uh, for that perspective, my friend Kenna, uh, always controversial, he's asking, what do you do to the experts in the newsroom? They always ask for payment. Is that, is, <laughs> I don't know if you're able to, uh, to answer that. <laughs> and as we think about that, uh, Wallis, I know you're caught to uh, most of these interviews, uh, what can be done uh, about that? Um, uh, are experts willing to do public good and to educate communities on, 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 on climate change and other issues in the media? Uh, one thing I can say is that uh, to be an expert is an investment. You don't just wake up and uh, be an expert in anything. You invest it into it. So probably uh, I will not blame the expert for expecting pay for a, 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 a day's job. So probably uh, uh, we need to increase experts so that uh, they don't become very expensive. 
because I don't imagine uh, somebody spending uh, their hours and just giving free information, probably in the church groups and channels. But when it's a formal engagement, uh, most likely they are going to charge for a fee. Uh, so uh, that's my experience with the, uh, there's nobody who is going to give free information or uh, free expertise. If you go to the doctor, they, they will, actually even before you see them, you pay. You are, if you go to a lawyer, the engineer, everybody. So a credit expert probably like now, uh, they would be all over the place trying to sell uh, their expertise. Now that everybody has come and go. And now that everybody is trying to fit their, 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 their profession to fit into climate change. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I, I was in a climate summit some time back at Sarango University, and I saw a very interesting presentation from a lawyer. Then they have run away with the issue of climate justice. Uh, very soon, we are going to hear stuff on uh, reparations. Uh, I think even that's, that's part of what was happening here. Uh, why was Africa speaking in one voice? It's because Africa is suffering from uh, climate, uh, uh, devastating climate effects, yet there are very uh, minimal contributors to the phenomenon. So uh, a lawyer would come and probably see how to monetize that. And before he does that, uh, you will have put in a lot of uh, skills to use. So uh, in terms of uh, payments, I don't think you can run away from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've asked you to write whether you have a climate desk at your media house, as well as to tell the local language. Uh, so uh, I see there are a couple of very interesting answers. I'm not sure I'm able to read these uh, because they're in local languages. But one of the things I've noticed is that you're not telling us, uh, like Angela Kazengwa, uh, you're writing uh, climate change, but you didn't tell us in which language and from which region, that would really help us uh, because I'm thinking we can do uh, a tip sheet and email to everyone to look uh, into that. Uh, uh, Kenna, uh, I think Swahili Mabadiliko Yahali Anga, um, uh, I think you joined in late. There was a discussion about, is it Tambianchi? Am I pronouncing that well? Uh, I find most uh, uh, use that term, uh, the latter term. And uh, climate change, this is Kobe and Lillian, uh, climate change in my local language, Muvasu Mululu. Uh, please, Lillian, tell us which language is this uh, and uh, which community and which uh, region. Um, in my Western Uganda local language, that's Zadok, climate change is uh, that word, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put that down somewhere and maybe we can follow up with you to give us further uh, explanation to see if it's an actual word or it's an explanation uh, or an explainer of what we're experiencing today. Uh, there was a need to set up an expert desk, yes, yes, uh, but, but we should have a joint production. Yeah, this for for organizers to note uh, in future uh, conferences. Uh, Ogaroku Wariera, a uh, change in weather, a uh, direct translator from my community. Uh, Mila Masidas, that is Kikuyu of Kenya. I'm Harik, we have it there. Uh, so kindly, uh, we are almost uh, finishing with our webinar. Uh, if you could uh, give us this as uh, uh, information. Zadok is based at the monitor in Uganda. He says they are yet to have a climate desk. Uh, Roslyn says, uh, okay, that's an information that we can use. Uh, we look into that. Uh, Kenya, Rwanda, I've uh, been to Rwanda, uh, and they really communicate well. They are using their local language. Uh, that is Kenya, Rwanda, which I think is advantageous. I look at the country, you know, like Kenya, uh, we have 44 ethnic uh, tongues. So it would be very difficult uh, to have an all encompassing language, uh, but at least we use Kiswahili, uh, which again is technical to most of us. Uh, so Kenya Ronda, they have a word for that. And uh, please look at the chat uh, to find uh, more of these. Uh, so my panelists, uh, any question? Uh, that you feel that we've not looked into 
uh, that we you really feel itching uh, to answer, uh, George. Gilbert Kimchui as George and Mute. Uh, there's that last question I've seen there. What's the place of community radio, radio in tackling climate change? We really address that. And we said it's a good thing that most uh, of the people who we surveyed uh, a report on radio are indeed uh, very important. That's why we're talking about local languages. Uh, for those people who have an opportunity to tell uh, uh, to tell the story of climate change uh, in local languages, you really have your work cut out uh, because we need uh, to reach communities. Uh, one of the things we've not discussed uh, is about the solutions. Uh, as we looking into climate misinformation, we're not doing this uh, for the sake of it. Uh, we're trying to see what are the solution. The solution is uh, to do more capacity building, to do more trainings. And for you, when you're telling these stories, uh, we know, yes, uh, climate change impacts uh, wreak havoc. Uh, but when we are telling this story, we need to tell communities the solutions uh, that are there. What can they do to find resilience? What can they do to adapt? What can they do uh, to mitigate uh, the impacts of climate change? And I always tell people when they're doing the trainings, please, please try not to use those words that I'm using, adaptation, mitigation, just look uh, for explainers uh, to tell people uh, what is adaptation and what are you know are these solutions uh, to adaptation. Uh, so it's very important. Yeah, uh, the, the the radio uh, really stands as king uh, in telling uh, these uh, societal uh, stories. Uh, George, I didn't get your question accurately. Kind of no, uh, is there any question that you really itching to answer? Uh, because I think I've read uh, most of the questions here. Oh, okay. I have responded no. to quite a number. Yes. Y yes, and uh, uh, some uh, th th there's somebody who was asking. Uh, people are building on wetlands, and uh, we know uh, these things are just not sustainable. How can we stop this, and how can we change the narrative? And I want to believe that, uh, yes, journalists said they needed capacity building, they needed training. And I, I want to believe once that kind of an intervention is done, or once that kind of a forum is there for journalists to be effective uh, reporters, it will be uh, easier for communities to engage in these climate debates because it will be done in languages they can understand in vocabularies uh, that have de been demystified uh, and stuff like that. So we also expect the input of journalism to hard in hard go to the ground and impact on uh, communities and change change the behavior. Uh, there was also an issue of, uh, of, uh, of um, whether we looked at uh, a climate story that has converted a community and what is the result. And I want at this juncture to clarify that this was uh, an exploratory study. We really wanted to know uh, what is it that uh, journalists in this region are doing with the climate reporting? Is it being done? Uh, in what manner is it being done? And that by itself, has given us uh, lots of leads because it has opened up uh, interesting information that uh, we lack capacity, uh, there are challenges on the ground, there are even uh, other challenges including harassment, uh, bribery, uh, online harassment, uh, etc. There are many, many, many uh, unhealthy practices that are on the ground. And that now gives us a, a, a kind of a point or some information that makes us reflect further on, okay, what direction do we take? And one of the critical ones that has come out is, this is not going to be a lone ranger journey for journalists alone. We need to network with the, with the governments because they are key stakeholders. Uh, we need to uh, network with the climate experts. Mm -hmm. There is a manner. What what do they when they see us, the journalists reporting about climate information? What comes into their mind? What do, do they want uh, communicated? Those kind of platforms uh, need to be built so that what journalists are disseminating is resonating well with governments 
is resonating well with the uh, with with the subject area experts, and at the same time, uh, dialogues are pretty clear. Is this uh, information or is it misinformation or is it disinformation? So that one will be very clear once we build uh, the capacity. So those are the two key areas I wanted to highlight because they are coming uh, as a recurrent. So there are there are future studies that uh, could be done to try and uh, streamline this uh, issue of uh, climate journalism. Thank you. Thank you, George. Allow me to be on your case because you're talking about jargon and experts coming down uh, from the lofty part to communicate. And you've just answered uh, that question and also you uh, tapped in uh, saying this was exploratory study. I'm very uh, sure uh, not, may, not many people will understand back you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you, if I'm wrong, sorry. You mean uh, there have not been many studies done for this, and this study as a pilot uh, will give, you know, will call for more studies uh, to be done specifically uh, uh, for the salient points that are raised. Yeah, like, 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 uh, has climate, uh, how many climate study? I mean, how many climate stories have we had in a period of time? I think Wallis, you had intimated that uh, has those stories led into uh, into government policy. Uh, for instance, uh, there's someone asking um, uh, when uh, uh, someone is asking uh, how can we, you know, collaborate? How can journalists collaborate with NGOs? Probably that can give rise to a study that's looking into these, have, have there those kind of connections? I think that's what James, uh, I mean, uh, George uh, means by, uh, for us, not having been a lot of research uh, done uh, from uh, this site as compared to the global north um, or in the developed world, uh, if you like. And uh, we asked you to ask these questions on the Q&A, uh, but there was one in the chat that I was not able to read uh, that was asking when, when we were doing this study, uh, did, we, did we collaborate uh, with uh, educational institutions uh, like universities? Um, can, can we answer that, Jackie? So uh, I saw that question and yes, we for the key informants, we were not only picking on journalists. For the key informants, we partnered with the people like Wallace, who is an educationist, we partnered with NGOs. We partnered with the climate activists. Like uh, in Kenya, we also uh, we got information from Power Shift Africa, Mohamed Ado. And uh, in Uganda, we had uh, partners like Info Nile. We had the uh, United Nations of Uganda. In Tanzania, we partnered with journalism meet in networks like Jamibora. We partnered with the a journalist and a editor. So it was not just uh, limited to the to the journalist. For the online survey, we only did for, most it was for the journalist. But when we went deeper, like we want now to get the bigger picture, that's why we had a purposeful sample of people who are stakeholders in the climate space, from educationists, from the journalists themselves, from the experts and even NGOs, yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, there is a gentleman called Moses Chira. He's not making our work any easier. He's asking, what is the Braille sign and sign language for climate change? <laughs> so Moses Chira has joined the to, to Chokoza. You know what Chokoza means? <laughs> Thanks, Moses, for joining. I know Moses. Moses uh, is uh, has a uh, visual disability and that's why he's just following keenly and listening to us so thanks panelists for being audible because he just texted me to say he's, we are audible but he can't see us but uh, most as you know we are in the disability movement we are working towards all this making media accessible and even having all these signs so maybe we can follow up on that thank you for joining yeah it's a very important point and for all the people that are joining us who run programs uh, that's a very interesting question, and I think now that uh, fortunately we are having media houses. Uh, Mr. Wallace, when I was uh, doing journalism from the year I started in 2007 to about 2015, that's when I was in the newsroom. We didn't have a lot of 
coverage for the environment, biodiversity, conservation, as well as climate change. Uh, but now because we are all living it, uh, we're seeing the devastating impact. Uh, I think the media houses have really, you know, woken up and, you know, smell the coffee and they are able to tell these stories. I think I'll be on the lookout, uh, Chira, uh, to see uh, if we actually have a sign language uh, for uh, for climate change, even as we, we look at uh, our local languages. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, Jackie, I also, also follow, you, you remember when I was telling you when America elects a president, uh, you know, like, uh, like Joe Biden, uh, there was a sign language uh, for his name, uh, and then there wasn't a sign language uh, for the deputy, uh, for the vice president, uh, uh, Harris, and there was a call out there uh, for the people to compete, to come up uh, with how they will uh, do that, uh, how they'll come up with a universal uh, sign language uh, name uh, for the U.S. Vice President. It, it was very interesting uh, to, to follow up and see uh, uh, the person who, uh, who won and how it looked like. Uh, it would be great uh, to see that being done for uh, these subject issues like climate change, if not already. Uh, so, uh, can I get your closing remarks? Uh, we need to uh, close shop at uh, half past. Uh, we're headed there. Uh, Hannah, my colleague, if not already, uh, can you share? You have shared already. Uh, colleagues, if you look at uh, the last text uh, on the chat, uh, you will see a form kindly as we get the uh, final remarks. Uh, please uh, jot uh, very quickly. Uh, on that form to give us your feedback that really help, helps uh, in our programming. And uh, if you're not able, you can copy that and, and make sure you can refill it uh, this afternoon. And uh, and uh, please, if, I hope you've been able to look at, uh, to check uh, out the chats again. Uh, someone from the standard, Robert, uh, says they have a pullout at the standard that is in Kenya uh, called uh, the planet action, but they don't have an independent climate desk like that for sports. Uh, so I think it's important uh, in high time uh, that we lobby for this and for the partners who are listening in uh, who are able to support this work. I think it's high time uh, to do our collaborations uh, on this. Uh, again, uh, we'll be able to upload uh, this recording uh, online and we have all your emails. Uh, we'll send you the presentations. Uh, in what you call a resource email, uh, as well as the report. Someone was asking whether they, you will get the report tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. We are done with it. Uh, we're just doing the final touches, and that's the designer to give it you know, a nice look uh, that's friendly to your eye. Uh, so closing remarks, ladies first, Jackie. Yeah, thank you so much, guys, for joining in and also for participating in our research. I just say there are some positive things that are being done, even for the journalists who are talking about experts not being available. Uh, when a journalist, uh, NGOs, and media come together and collaborate, then indeed we can have experts who can volunteer because they will be working like a working group and be able to give information. Case in point, like the air pollution uh, project that we are running at Internews, we've been seeing uh, of late, we have so many stories coming up on air pollution with experts' opinion. Those experts is because we had that training, we link them with the journalists, so they have a relationship already, and they can be able now to invite them at any given time and they give them an expert view. So it is not uh, it is not done until it is done. So we are hoping that after this launch, we can also be able to do capacity building, we can be able to do linkages, and then we can have a climate story out there. And also for lecturers or people in the media institution who are there, if we can have uh, climate uh, reporting, I know some universities, especially university, uh, private university, they have um, environmental reporting as a unit, but it is a specialized unit, meaning it is not a must you do it as a unit. So maybe that is a good start, but if we can have like environmental reporting, climate reporting as a unit that you have to take like any other units, 
then it will be a good stepping stone because when journalists are trained, even at media institution, it is easier for them to report when they come to the field. With lack of information is when we get even afraid to report on climate and science journalism because we fear the jargons. Thank you so much. And I hope you read our report and give us feedback. Thank you. George, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, George, please. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, as a parting shot, I would want to draw attention of everyone to, to the recommendations. We have made recommendations for journalists. We have made recommendations for media houses. We have made recommendations for journalist networks and for financiers. Please have a look at them because there are some key uh, areas or directions we have provided that are going to make our climate journalism better than it is today. If it is uh, for journalists, it is critical that we enhance our capacity uh, on climate journalism. If it is for, for, for the networks, we need to improve uh, our networks, uh, equip them with the databases of climate experts, um, even if it means uh, getting attachment or seeing how stories are covered in other regions that uh, maybe have better climate reporting, we need to go to those extents. Same case to media houses. I know some of the uh, people we are talking to are bosses in media houses and the recommendations for media houses about climate desks, et cetera, et cetera, and also for finances. So it will be a worthwhile um, exercise uh, to look at the, uh, the recommendations and uh, try to localize them in each and every journalist or media house position. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, George. Uh, can we now go to uh, Wallace? Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a very uh, useful discussion and uh, important for that matter. Uh, but before I make my conclusion, there is something George said, and I would want to, everyone to ask everyone here today. Why is the uh, weather forecast accurate for the aviation, but not for the farm? Going to ponder. Now, <laughs> my parting shot would be that because this is a group of journalists, uh, we need to focus now more on the information aspect of climate change as opposed to the news. Uh, the news, you talk about the newsmakers, the, the event, uh, the number of people attending, and all that, but the information must be. We are going to give uh, perspectives. We are going to give us uh, initiatives. We are going to give us the success stories, the impact. Huh? You know, uh, those kind of things that uh, really resonate with somebody's life. Uh, we are talking about uh, the opportunities for uh, this climate change, not only for journalists, but also even for the youth who are the majority. There is this they are calling uh, um, uh, the enterprise aspect of uh, climate change, the green stuff. So uh, if we have stories that uh, success, already have done that, probably you might uh, inspire uh, people to take action and they probably do something useful uh, while at the same time taking climate action. Another thing I want to encourage the journalists here is that uh, as we, we have identified the need for training, uh, as a, one of the forms, to, uh, there's a lot of free training out there. Unlike back in the day, when you go to a library, to, uh, when you had to go to a library to get, or maybe to be sponsored to a project to get information, uh, much of what we know about climate change is self taught. So there's a lot of uh, information on the internet from uh, organizations like uh, Art Journalism, Thomson Reuters, uh, UNFCC. There's a lot that you can learn from there. Recently, the uh, UNDP released a dictionary of climate change. Look for it and get appraised on what those technologies mean. So even as you wait for opportunities to come for training, be able to train yourself uh, from these free resources, which are all over the place, and you see yourself uh, going places. Um, I think, uh, finally, I would want to mention that uh, uh, even uh, someone who asked about the uh, collaborations with NGOs and all that, uh, we risk, now that there is public climate that is coming, uh, we risk uh, the media agenda being hijacked by those funders. So uh, we should not forget the government rules 
on the current role of uh, media houses being oversight, providing information, and also being a watchdog of what roles the uh, major funders are doing. So uh, uh, there are those who would want, there's that term called uh, greenwashing, for example. There are those who want to come and tell us uh, how much they are doing in terms of climate change, but they are basically greenwashing. So it is part of uh, misinformation, and the journalists should be aware of that. Thank you so much, and it was great talking to you. Thank you so much, Wallace, and most importantly for letting out my age. Uh, but um, uh, my remarks, uh, I, I will read, there is a gentleman in the question who asked me to read his chat, and his name is Nelson. And when you're talking about greenwashing, uh, it's another term uh, that we really need to recognize. Uh, but even as we look into how to report in our local languages, he's re reminding us that even language can be a havoc uh doesn't matter whether it's english or kiswahili and he says one month ago i was collecting data on climate change news perceptions in western uganda a farmer informed me that even news aired in local languages often had words that were scientific and had to uh, find their meaning she told me sometimes news reporters mention words like global warming even when they are reporting in their local language and this leaves the farmers confused. If a story is being reported in a local language, and then one specific word cannot be changed to the local language, what is left? That's not a rhetoric question. It's something that uh, we really need to be cognizant of. Uh, I know here in Kenya and indeed many other countries where we are blessed with more than one language, we like to code switch uh, between Kiswahili and Kenya Rwanda and English if we cannot find that word. So it's really a very big challenge uh, for us. I, I think there was also Rebecca uh, who was uh, reminding us about uh, tree planting, uh, you know, being one uh, of the mitigating, uh, if uh, you know, uh, things that we can do for climate change. And she was reminding us about our former president, uh, Moy Days, uh, and the campaigns he was doing about if you cut one tree, uh, plant another one. Yes, uh, we see a lot of campaigns as well as at stage, uh, but there are many other, you know, solutions uh, from that. But one of the things that I wanted to bring uh, to your attention is that uh, uh, we should go beyond advocating and writing about and talking in the media about tree planting, uh, but into tree growing. Uh, because what happens after we ceremoniously uh, plant trees, uh, we need to grow them uh, to... Uh, to maturity, if uh, that has to be effective, but also be on the lookout uh, for other solutions, you know, like adapting uh, to renewable energy, uh, uh, even for yourself, biking to work, you know, walking to work, uh, because uh, public transport uh, and other types of uh, transport, even the food production, uh, we're burning a lot of uh, fossil fuels, uh, you know, that uh, cause uh, you know, emit uh, greenhouse gases. We really need to educate ourselves on these. And there are other organizations, a lot of them that are doing this kind of trainings, including us here at Internews. And that will be my last word uh, that we are hoping uh, with this report, uh, we are able to do more uh, than we've been doing uh, here in East Africa, as well as globally uh, on training and capacitating you to be able uh, to tell this story better. So be on the lookout. Uh, on our website again, internews, as well as on earthjournalism.net uh, uh, for these and more resources and for future trainings, as well as uh, spon sponsorship uh, to attend international conferences. But in all this, I uh, think global, act local. And thank you so much uh, for joining us and God bless you. God bless this great African continent. Kwaheri.